Hi, my name is Mohan Bhatteri. I'm a staff solutions architect at VMware. And uh, today I and my colleague Sudhir Balasubramanian, um, who is a senior staff solutions architect at VMware, are going to present to you this topic, pure storage and vVols, a game changer for database as a service. Let's move to the agenda. So why vVols is, uh, is the first topic we'll look at. Then uh, we'll look at why vVols and uh, Vivo, how vVols is a game changer for database as a service. And then uh, we will conclude. Why vVols? Each LUN volume has a specific capability. When a LUN or volume is provisioned, it is set up with specific features or capabilities. It requires every data, it requires a data store per capability. Changing the capabilities of an existing LUN or volume requires migrating VMs to another data store. Changing is very arduous. It is very hard to change an existing capability requires destroying and recreating LUNs and volumes, which is very, very different, difficult to do. So to provide increasing operational management, you require, uh, you actually have to, like you see on the side here, uh, spreadsheets to manage your environment. That's how traditionally things are done. But VWALs can change all of this. So if you look at uh, LUNs or volumes, they are pretty really rigid and are fixed in capabilities. They also require a file system such as VMFS or NFS. With vVols, there is no file system. It's inside each vVol that a file system is created and that file depends on the OS or the vVol function. With regards to the capabilities, generally a LUN or volume is provisioned with a specific set of capabilities and that isn't easily changed without creating a new LUN or volume. With vVols, changing the capability is simple. With the simple change of uh, what we call is a, a, a policy storage provision policy, right? The, the capability is changed and no storage v motion or data migration is required. Depending on the array, you can actually change from spinning media to all flash with just the policy change. The array then handles the performance and the data migration. No admin action is required, imagine that. Another key aspect of vWALS over traditional storage is that the array and vSphere are complete insight into the data and IO requirements. Uh, the array will manage all of these rather than vSphere, like in the legacy environment. So it's managed in a much better way. So now um, uh, let's look at storage policies and how they help here. By util utilizing storage, what we call SPBM to manage the storage, the need to physically migrate virtual machines to different data stores to get different capabilities is no longer needed. By changing a policy, the VM will get the new policy, new capabilities from that policy. So even things like replication and, uh, and other performance capabilities that you would need are automatically available through the policy change. When the VM policy change, for example, is changed to production, the VM is automatically replicated to, uh, and whatever policy that the production requires is automatically applied for the VM. So that's, uh, here we see a lot of different things that we can do. Every VM has its own different capabilities and we are not really changing anything with the array. Everything's happening with vVols. We are just, uh, we are able to kind of have all these VMs operate at different policies, sharing the same storage. One other important aspect, because the array owns the vVolt and its capabilities, such as snapshots, clones, replication, it is much faster. It is much more efficient because uh, it, there is no intermediary. The array does all the work. Uh, vSphere just passes the, uh, all, the, all the functions and the responsibilities directly to the array. So things like clones and snapshots, which kind of uh, VM uh, vSphere used to do it, 
uh, on its own accord is now done by the array. Um, it exploits native capabilities such as instant deletion. It provides inherent space efficiencies. And policy changes can also be easily integrated. You can have both uh, con uh, you know, storage containers and uh, LUNs uh, simultaneously. Policy, all policy changes are happening behind the scenes and you can also apply QoS and other policies on the fly. So now we'll just look at uh, how snapshots work in traditional BMFS versus uh, how it operates in VWALS. With traditional storage, snapshots are managed by vSphere. Although vSphere is efficient with snapshots, arrays are much better at doing that job. With typical VMware snapshots, a secondary sparse disk is created and all new IO goes to that disk. If this disk, is, if this disk is not removed, it can continue to grow even larger than the original disk. And if more snapshots are created, more chains are created, as you can see uh, in the animation in the, in the left-hand side here. So consequently, performance of the VM can be impacted because now you know, the IO is spread across multiple VMs, multiple disks attached to a single VM. This is the norm, but if, uh, and it can be quite a bit, uh, and it also takes a lot of uh, time to delete if you, when it, when a snapshot is created, uh, it happens instantaneously. But when a delete, when, when you try to delete the snapshots, it takes a long time because it has to clear out all these disks and the redo logs and other aspects. And it could take many hours to delete. And at those times, the VM could be impacted for performance. So now let's look at how the same thing happens in the VWAL side. With VWALs, the snapshots happen on the array. And the array-based snapshots are point-in-time pictures of the data and take very little space. When a VWAL snapshot exists, the IO is not redirected and instead continues to go to the same disks on the VWAL. Leaving a VWAL snapshot alone will not continue to grow and can be copied to another array and even used as a copy to clone from the original. When a VWAL snapshot is deleted, the snapshot is quickly removed with no impact to the VM. Regardless of how many snapshots are part of a VM, there is no performance impact on the VM. That's a huge difference here. So, so another important aspect is also is that VWALs make replication really easy. So with VMware virtual volumes, uh, introduce the concept of replication groups this brings the accurate and responsive recovery of individual virtual machines. A replication group is a group of replicated storage devices that are defined by the storage administrator to provide atomic failover. That means you can choose a subset of VMs or apps that failover together and, uh, um, and, and that's kind of how you provide atomic failover. In the past, uh, in the traditional legacy world, uh, this is a, it is it is very hard to do. Replication groups also define the set of VWALs that are maintained in a right order fidelity, where writes are replicated on the same destination site in the exact same order they're generated at the source site. This ensures that anytime the destination site represents a, cr a crash consistent copy of the data on the source site. So you can have multiple policies and based on those policies, replications could happen to the remote site. Now I pass it on to Sudhir to talk about VWALS for DBS service. Thank you, Mon. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so let's first define or let's first understand what DB as a service actually means, right? Essentially, it's the ability to manage monitor and provision databases resources on demand through self surface catalogs with minimal requirements for installation and configuration of hardware or software upfront right so the essentially the idea is to allow database consumers such as application developers such as dba such as testers the architects the owners to provision databases easily 
and quickly using what's called an on-demand self-service platform, right? So what essentially are some of the benefits of DB as a service? You know, what happens is the application time, right? So there's a reduction in the app application time to market. What DB as a service gives us is the ability to rapidly develop test and deploy new applications at a fraction of the time it used to take with legacy systems. So now it's easier, now it's faster you know, a time to market the new applications, right? The second benefit that actually comes to mind is automation of database lifecycle management, right? As we all understand, database sprawl is a major problem in many companies. It's very difficult to keep track of all the database instances that have been deployed. And this has serious repercussions. This has serious implications, you know, not only from licensing perspective, also from data governance and also from security standpoint. With DB as a service, one can ensure that we have complete visibility into our database environment. We are able to enforce that governance through policy-based management. Right. Another benefit of database as a service essentially is you're able to increase the operational efficiency and resource utilization. Right. So database as a service increases the efficiency of both your database application and also the infrastructure team. What here happens is the storage administrator will no longer need to spend time and effort on provisioning storage resources for databases. On the other hand, DBS will no longer have to wait for DB resources to be allocated and provisioned. So essentially, we are now freeing up time for both of the teams, right? So if you look at the slide here, some of the use cases of database as a service that essentially comes to our mind uh, could be like defining templates of Oracle DB VMs to be, to be available in a self-service catalog. You're able to commission, you're able to decommission single instance Oracle rack from that self-service catalog. You can clone databases, you can refresh databases, you can back it up, you can restore, you can add, you can uh, remove nodes to an Oracle rack cluster on the fly. You can even have some, some kind of metering, you can have some kind of reporting as well, right? So, I mean, besides all this, an important factor that comes in my mind that we have to keep in mind is oftentimes what happens is the storage performance is the limiting factor that hinders database as service projects. So traditional disk-based storage, that cannot meet performance need for DB as a service. And it's inherently too complicated to manage, to manage right? So DB as a service, what it requires, what it entails is high performing storage infrastructure to ensure rapid provisioning of databases. You need to have efficient data reduction to ensure storage capacity not exhausted, right? We need to have a high degree of resilience to ensure minimal to no downtime. And of course, maybe as a service, you need to have what's called the ease of use and maintenance and management as well. Next slide, please. All right. So having looked into what DB as a service is and having looked into what database as a service requires, right? And we also looked at some of the potential use cases. Let's now change tack and look at some of the requirements that business critical workloads they have, right? So any business critical workload, Oracle is no particular in this sense here, right? They have certain SLAs, they have certain RTOs, they have certain RPOs, and they have a set of requirements. And those requirements include high availability, performance, recoverability, scaling up, scaling out, essentially scalability, security, so on and so forth, right? And these are strict requirements for day to operation also to complete in a timely fashion. For example, if you have your backups, you have your cloning operation, if you have your refresh operations, you wanna make sure that these operations complete in a timely fashion so that they don't, uh, they don't affect performance. They are within the SLAs for that particular application, right? So what happens is with virtualization of Oracle workloads, and you know, customers, they have certain concerns. And some of the concerns include, well, you know, different databases have different levels of criticality. They require different storage performance characteristics and capabilities. Well, I would need to meet stringent SLAs for performance, right? And that's a challenge, especially with slow traditional uh, storage, right? The other thing that comes in our mind is, you know, with rapid database growth, what happens is there's a need to reduce backup window to meet the performance and business SLAs, right? And especially with these large database sizes, what then happens is there's difficulty in cloning. There's difficulty in refreshing data from production to QA or any other environment for, let's say, testing or for patching purposes, right? And again, last but not the least, using storage-based replication, as everybody understands, right? With storage-based replication, it's very superior as compared, you know, very, very compared to application-based replication when it comes to speed. But then what happens is you also get unnecessary data. And that unnecessary data is the VMDK of other databases that you do not want to copy as part of the storage-based replication. Next slide, please. 
So I'm not going to go into deep dive into the Devol architecture, but we'll see how we are able to overcome some of the challenges that we posed in the earlier section here. So, you know, we had this concept of SPBM, and Mohan spoke about it, the storage policy-based management. Well, that essentially is a storage policy framework that helps administrators to match the VM workload requirement to storage capabilities. So what happens now is SPBM runs as an independent service in vCenter, right? And it helps to align the storage, the application demands that every workload has. Right. What SPBM does, it enables the following mechanism. It advertises the storage capabilities, as Mohan, as Mohan said. It advertises the data services offered by storage arrays and other entities. Right. It also facilitates the bi-directional communication between ESXi and vCenter on one side, right, and storage arrays and entities on the other side. Right. And what happens? It helps with virtual machine provisioning. You are basically using what's called the VM storage policies. Right. The other thing to keep in mind is with Vwall not only do we get storage based replication with superior speed we also what get what's called the vm level granularity as i mentioned before the level of granularity is no longer on the lun it's no longer on the data store side it's more on the vm side right so that becomes a unit of storage management right and now since all of the vm dk so the virtual disk or the vms are now vwall based operations like cloning operations like backup refreshes restore they become blazingly fast because they are all storage based operations right so the db growth which was a concern before that's no longer a concern now especially from a performance or an sla perspective next slide please so to wrap up as part of the conclusion right with databases service using virtual volume right we understood as to how business critical databases they typically are among the large last of the workloads to be virtualized because of the challenges as we know pose as workloads are grow and the scale especially with day two operations i mean there's a big, there's a big challenge trying to meet strict business sla for performance and trying to manage rapidly growing databases trying to make sure that these database backup uh, fits within the backup window that we don't impact the system performance we don't you know impact any kind of uh, uh, metrics that we meet the slas we meet the rpos and rpos these factors typically they force DBS to delay virtualization of their business critical databases and workloads, right? And tack on to that, the fact that you have cloning, you have refreshing operations as well, that every DBA, he or she would have to do as part of the day-to-day -day life, that further complicates matter. So what VMware virtual volume of VWALS, as we call that, they address the challenges of day-to-day -day operation, including the backup, including the recovery, the cloning and database provisioning and so on and so forth. And you are able to use VWALS as a mechanism, right? When we go into databases service or when we go into any of the use cases that databases service provides, especially, you know, with provisioning databases, commissioning, decommissioning, cloning, refreshing, right? If you have to patch or let's say if you have to, uh, you know, do metering or reporting or if you have to add nodes or if you have to remove nodes from a rack cluster. And there's a link in the bottom of the slide that essentially is the reference architecture. And that basically validated any of the day two operations of both single instance database and Oracle rack on VWAL using pure storage flash array X50. Uh, some of the use cases that we covered were backup and restore, cloning, refreshing, patching, and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so in conclusion, there are a couple of resources that we have put up here. Uh, essentially, that's the one-stop shop where anything and everything to do with Oracle on VMware, including uh, licensing, including virtual volumes, uh, persistent memory, PBR DMA, best practices, Oracle Rack Guide, everything can be found there. We also have a VMware VWAL resource pages, uh, the link as well at the bottom of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. But I think we are at the uh, end of our session here. So thank you and thank you for listening to us. Thank you very much. Appreciate your listening to us.